Hello and welcome to Midweek Wednesday. I have to tell you, preaching to you all and preaching to 1215 is such a different experience. <laughs> at 6.05, you all go, hmm, we're ready. And at 1215, they're like, it's so joyful still. <laughs> and it leaves a very different experience for me as a leader to walk into this space where you guys are ready in an instant for meditation. <laughs> and so I walk there with you. And this time of sacredness we have engaged for the last five weeks, it has bubbled up some wonderful and beautiful things that are important to carry forward. So after prayer and discernment, starting the week after Easter, not Easter week, but the week after Easter at 12.15 and 6.05 to kind of hold the space for people to come and pray with God, I will come in here and pray for the church and pray for people and pray with people. We're calling it at points of prayer. So in your life, if you come to that moment where you want to pray for somebody or, or have someone to pray with at 12.15 and 6.05 on Wednesdays, you know you can walk in here and find a person to help carry your story to God. Or maybe you're empowered and you want to come be with me and help carry other people's stories to God. Not the details, of course, that's their their business, but just a public way of saying, we pray for our community and we're praying for the church and we're praying for the well-being of all involved around us, a way for us to love our neighbors as ourself. So know that is coming. But that's again the week after Easter. In the immediacy, there is something coming. And so this weekend, when you wake up on Sunday morning, don't ask the question, is church open? I'm inviting you to ask the question, is it safe for me to go out? Because Sandra and I and the council president and I will wake up early and we'll have some decisions to make. And how we respond to make sure worship exists for you will be different than how you need to respond. It might be I have to get here anyway to lead worship from my office on the computer, right? But that doesn't mean you have to show up if you feel like it's unsafe or difficult because you can still listen on the radio or you can catch whatever craziness comes on Facebook. If God decides to part the heavens and drop 20 inches on us, that will be the choice, right? So I just, we just want you to know your care and well-being is the priority. And the message of the gospel will be there, whether it shows up on Facebook or on the radio. And if there's nothing on the ground, it will show up right here as it does every Sunday ready for you, okay? Just make your safety the priority. Can we do that together? All right. With that said then, I ask us to turn to the now where we greet God together in this place. Please stand as you are able. Sandra, that TV is not on. Wise God, you are older than the ages and you dance in the sunlight. Wise God, you share bread with strangers and you welcome little children. Wise God, you wrestle with the powerful and you comfort those who need you. Wise God, shining in darkness, you break the bonds of confusion and you light our path toward healing.
lost in the enveloping tenderness of God's love, crying out with longing for the touch of God, humble by the knowledge of need for God's redemption, silent in the face of the true word of God, held in the arms of God's tender compassion. Take from my instep the skein of damage that has threaded its way through my life like a tightening cord. Take from my body the wounds of unloving that punctures and bruises like a sword. Take from my mind the dark engulfing that has judged my life like a condemning word. Take from my soul the unbelieving that made you seem like a lost God. By the authority of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are washed clean, not a sprinkle, but a bucket of forgiveness is poured over you. You are drenched in the sea of God's love, standing in waves of mercy and grace. Amen and amen. Let us pray together. God of community, your greatest command demands that we use all of ourselves to love and honor you and others. This is a profound act of generosity. Help us live it in relationship to our neighbors and ourself as a way of honoring you. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Our first lesson today comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse starting at verse 17. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Our next lesson is again from Mark chapter 12 and like last week we're going to say it together because it's part of our heart and our experience now. There was a Pharisee that came along and seeing that Jesus was answering questions well he said to Jesus what is the greatest commandment and Jesus said you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart with all of your soul with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So five weeks ago, we began this Lent series with a deep dive connecting some dots. Jesus' words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which he names as the most important commandment, is directly related to Deuteronomy chapter 6. That was the time when Moses was standing on the edge of a river with the people, and he was giving them a sermon to empower them to go into the new land. And he was inviting them to consider and know this is the expectation of behavior as you go forward. So when Jesus says this himself, he's not creating a new way of being. He is resurfacing the command of God in a fresh new way for people that have forgotten. Then Jesus says the second most important command is love your neighbor as yourself. Now I ask of you, do you ever wonder where Jesus got those words from? Well, it too is scriptural. And it came from the first section we read today, Leviticus 19, where Jesus said, where in Leviticus it says, you shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin, you shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur yourself guilt. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In that moment, God, through Moses, 
way back even in Leviticus, is laying down the expectation of what it means to engage and be a neighbor. And Jesus is resurfacing that. And for the last five weeks, all of the language we have heard has been clear words about what relationships should look like. God expects, God expects that God's people will live a certain lifestyle, which includes helping the poor and needy, protecting the widow and the orphan, showing kindness and mercy, not devising evil, not taking vengeance, or bearing a grudge. In recorded human history, for 200, 2,800 years, okay, that's recorded human history, like biblical history, 2,800 years, God has been speaking of behavior that is about lifting others up and helping people. But yet, for 2,800 years, we still struggle to do it. We argue about it. Who is worthy? Who is not? We make judgments about what it looks like to offer grace and mercy. But the boundaries are very clear. Love your neighbor as yourself. And maybe therein is the problem. At least this is what C.S. Lewis argues. Do you guys know who C.S. Lewis is? I got two head shakes. C.S. Lewis is the author of the books Chronicles of Narnia. And something to know about C.S. Lewis is that when he sat down to write those books, he did it with intentionality. He wanted the world in the messy way that existed. Remember, he lived through World War II. He has the experience of watching bombs bombard and hate prevail against humanity. So when he sits down to write the Chronicles of Anarnia, it was with the explicit intention of teaching people about God who do not know God. Aslan is God. And he uses the mysticism of imagination to teach people about loving and mercy and grace. This is C.S. Lewis. But before Chronicles of Narnia, he wrote this other book called Mere Christianity. And in this book, he argues that we actually can't love our neighbors very well because we don't love ourselves very well. We treat others poorly because we actually treat ourselves poorly. When Jesus invites us to love our neighbor as ourself, do we ever stop and consider how our self-care or our lack thereof is directly reflected in our relationship to that person? There is a saying, you can't help others if you can't help yourself. Truth is, I confess to you all, I don't like that saying. I think it's an incredibly selfish saying. Because when I hear that saying, it's wrapped around this idea of, I can't fix them unless I fix myself. Well, how am I ever going to fix myself? Is it possible to fix me? No. I'm a really broken person. So what does it mean to fix me or help me before I can fix or help another person? And does that mean that I'm an object and that person is an object that can just simply be tinkered with by a set of tools to make us better? Is that all we are? Is something to be acted upon? Something where I can wield a certain set of values and vision for myself that forces another person to be fixed in the image that I think they're supposed to be? Is this what Jesus is saying? I think not. I rather think Jesus is suggesting that if I live with generosity and I live with compassion, and I live with love for myself, 
there's going to be this natural radiance that comes out. And those attributes will affect positive change in the life of another human being. It'll affect positive exchange with the relationships I have. But this is really hard to do when we're a society bent on extreme obsessions of fixing the problem. We name people into certain categories. Think about it. I could use labels like neurologically divergent, ADHD, depression. And the minute we do that, we start categorizing that person into a world where they need to be fixed and work in my way, the way the world says they need to be working. Or maybe we would rather fix them than look at ourself because fixing them hides our own insecurities we have about the self, covering up our own blemishes. I mean, it's easier to help others than open the emotional can of tension in our own lives. It's easier to say, look how great I am because I helped that person. But then I get to hide myself behind them. But consider that Jesus' words are a different kind of invitation to love on three layers, love God, love neighbor, love self. And Jesus' words remind us that love of neighbor is a direct reflection of how we love and honor God and how we love and honor the self. And Jesus himself then shows us what that love, in fact, does look like. And it's this thing called agape. Now, agape is a different kind of word. In Greek, there's at least eight different ways to express the word love, and so that's one of the reasons it's hard for us to understand fully scripture when we read it in the English language. Because they had eight words to express love, and we have one. So there's things like philo, which is Philadelphia, a city of brotherly love. Then there's erotica, and I think you all can handle that word without explanation. But agape, agape, that God in Jesus is talking a bit, agape God, agape your neighbor, agape the self, is sacrificial love that says, you are so important to me that I am willing to care for the self so that I am able to care for you more consistently. And sacrificial love says that you are so important to me that I am willing to enter a deep, committed relationship with God so that I can care for you more consistently. And sacrificial love is God saying, in the totality of himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he shows up as creator, savior, and advocate, all of himself, to enter a deep, committed relationship that means dying and raising so that he can be in a more committed relationship with you. Sacrificial love. This is what God does. He sees that we tend toward philo and we tend toward erotica and we confuse this idea of love and he is this consistent, consistent reminder that in that sacrifice, it is something that's powerful to bridge relationships. Bridge relationship with God, bridge relationship with neighbor, and even bridge those uncomfortable relationships we have with ourself. God shows up loving with all of his ability. So God greets his very first neighbor, creation itself, of which we are a part, so we know a better way. Amen.
with the whole church in our acts of meditation here, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Loving God, we bring to you the fullness of ourselves, our whole heart, our whole soul, all of our strength and all of our thinking, working in us for the revealing of your kingdom, for the poor in spirit, the poor on the street, and the working poor. Be with the poor today. Show them your care through the love of your people. For those who feel the pains of war by military action or gang violence, be with the suffering of our world Give them peace through the love of your people. For any suffering, loss of job, loss of love, and loss of self-worth, be with the depressed. Hold out your hand to them through the love of your people. For those who are isolated from a community of care, be with the lonely. Let them know you are with them through the love of your people. We extend these prayers to you, our Father. Hear us through the love of your Son and move us by the Holy Spirit into action. Amen. As the Spirit has gathered us here, let us pray the words of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
receive this blessing as a gift to carry with you to engage the world. May your lips always be ready with a prayer of compassion for others. May your mind be wise to offer wisdom to those who are lost. May your hands be strong to serve those who are weak. Blessed be your spirit rejoicing with the love of God. Amen.